Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening for this uh, webinar. This will be recorded and it will be on our website if you want to um, view it at another date. We are going to be discussing therapeutic management of chronic edema in the home care setting with Joshua Trock. My name is Julie Green and I'm the manager here at Clinical Services with Tactile Medical. Um, we are, I'm also a lymphedema therapist and we are very excited. Um, I had the chance of um, watching and listening to Josh last year at the NON conference and so I'm really excited to have him back um, to talk about his experience in home care setting. Now with COVID, but not only with COVID, as we move forward and the states start to open, what is this really going to look like for our patients um, that are really at risk for infection and immunocompromised? So I think with that, I'm going to just let Josh introduce himself. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for having me on. I've been looking forward to this and um, hopefully this will be a great evening of uh, education and fun for everyone. So as Julie mentioned, my name is Dr. Joshua Trock. I'm a, a physical therapist and I'm also a lymphedema therapist. I've uh, been working as a physical therapist and lymphedema therapist since 2011 here in San Antonio, where I'm at now. And I've worked exclusively in the home care setting. I uh, graduated and got cer uh, certified rather quickly out of, um, out of school. And right from the get-go, I realized I loved lymphedema, I loved home care, and wanted to uh, meld the two together. And uh, that's what I've been doing over the past uh, nine years now. Okay, so we are going to start to talk about, well, you have one disclosure, I think. Yes, those are my disclosures right there. Thank you. And so we were going to start with some polling questions. And so the, the first one was uh, what your clinical specialty is. Uh, lymphedema is something that kind of touches everyone, um, whether you're a PT, MD, nurse, and we want to know well, what your specialty is and, and who's watching us tonight. So it's like we have a, a lot of CLTs out there and it looks like people from all over, that's great, a wide variety. Wow, we do have a lot of CLTs. There. Yeah. And we also have a few MDs and PAs yeah. and, and a couple other disciplines, so good to see. So our second polling question was, uh, what is your, uh, sorry, uh, are you currently, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Should I go back? around. Yeah. There we go, yeah. Uh, what type of setting you work in? Um, just as with practitioners, all different types, we see lymphedema. Lymphedema is throughout the medical continuum, whether you're in a hospital, you're in a clinic, you're in an MD office, you're in a PT uh, office or clinic, or what I do in home care. So we wanna know where, where you're at and uh, who you're representing tonight. A lot of outpatient, lymphedema clinic. Uh, same thing all over wound clinic, home care. Yeah, some Good home care. Hear. Yeah. And awesome. inpatient acute care. That's, that's great to see that is, that, variety. Nice. That is awesome. That is awesome. So our, our next or third question was, uh, are you currently treating patients? And this is more uh, COVID specific, um, you know, region to region, um, your things have been kind of challenging for clinicians, whether it's not being able to be open, whether you're deemed essential or not. And we want to know if you're currently seeing patients or if, if you're not. Looking like, what, 60, 40, around there. And I'm guessing that's going to change as the weeks and months yeah. continue here. Um, so great. Thank you so much for that. And then finally, how are you treating are you treating your patients? I know there's been a huge push towards uh, telemedicine and um, you know doing things more virtually. And uh, we want to know: Are you doing it in home care or telehealth visits, or are you still having people come into the clinic or hospital? It's like still, yeah, good amount in clinic and hospital. Good to see telehealth visits, yeah, and home care. That's awesome. Okay. Well, it seems like we're, we're equally represented all over the place tonight, so that's great. Yeah. 
So Josh, I know that you have been in home care your whole um, experience as a physical therapist. So you have kind of a different perspective than maybe someone that has worked in an outpatient setting or in acute care setting. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me some of the unique challenges or tell me a little bit about um, your home care experience? So you know, home care is, a, is, in my opinion, a specialty in of itself because Unlike in a, in a clinic setting where you have the patient obviously come into you, you're, you're on their turf and um, you're able to kind of manipulate a lot of the variables. In the home, you have to treat not only the patient, but their environment, uh, their family, a lot of other dynamics that are going on. And so that's something that really needs to be considered when you're treating lymphedema because it is an all-encompassing thing. Um, you know, so many different aspects touch on lymphedema and treatment and, and overall outcomes. And so... Those are uh, those are some of the challenges that we have to face in the home, and uh, you know, kind of a, a perfect example of that is you could have um, an individual in you know, where they spend their day all day, right? You could have a person that is maybe in a in a poor chair or a wheelchair, and they spend all day in a dependent position. They're flexed at their knees and their hips, impeding lymphatic flow, and then you could do the the best bandaging job in the world at your clinic, but they go home and that's how they spend all day or even all night. They could be sleeping in a wheelchair for all you know, and that's really going to impair um, the capacity to heal. You know, contrast that to someone that has, you know, they're up in a nice bed or they have a really good recliner or they have the uh, really the ability with a caregiver to kind of change their positioning that will drastically affect your outcome. And that's something that we see in the home that we're able to kind of change and uh, move them towards a more positive uh, direction. So do you um, I know you most of your caseload is is um, lymphedema, would you say? And it, within that. Can you tell me how much of those lymphedema patients have wounds or do you see primarily wounds and they end up having lymphedema? So uh, where I'm at in San Antonio right now, we're the only ones that I know of that uh, treat patients in the home. And so probably 80, 85% of my patient caseload is lymphedema and wound care. It's what we're known for. And you know, over the past nine years, I've developed really good relationships with different vascular and, and wound clinics and um, really, uh, we were kind of the go-to for that um, because that's really what we've worked on. And so that's, yeah, that's probably the majority of what we see. And uh, so you, you get those reps and you get to see all the different types of lymphedema out there and, and get that experience over the years. Well, that is interesting. I didn't know that um, you had all of these relationships with the physicians because mm -hmm. in a home care agency, I, I had always assumed that you just work within um, within your group, but you are, you're constantly working with these vascular doctors and, and primary care as well. Oh, most definitely. Um, a lot of traveling primary care is, is great because they're, they're just like us. They're going into the house. Uh, they're seeing things that you may not see. I mean, for instance, you have someone that has bilateral lower extremity stage three lymphedema. They're not that apt to really be going out to a clinic. It may be challenging for them physically. It may be expensive. Um, so you, people like us, where we can go into the house and kind of remove that barrier of care, you get to see a lot more. And you, you know, the, the individuals that may have such severe conditions that uh, you know, prohibit them from leaving, you were able to kind of find them and, okay, let's initiate care and let's start to move them in a good direction. So now with the COVID, I'm sure that things have changed a little bit for yes. you. And um, has, that, has that changed the number of staff you have or the type of patient that you're seeing because maybe they weren't um they they probably are mobile but are considered homebound so tell us a little bit about what so yeah you know, there's not a person out there that hasn't been impacted by this yeah and exactly for us it was something where we saw it coming and we really knew what our role was and um, you know kind of how we fit into the spectrum and we saw it as an opportunity to really uh, continue to serve with what we've been doing and so you have individuals that you know, shelter in place, don't leave, stay at home, don't go anywhere. Well, yeah. we have the opportunity now to go and meet those individuals. Instead of them going into a big clinic with lots of other people, we're able to go and have that one-on-one -on -one time. And we can manipulate the variables by, in terms of what we do as, a, as therapists, as a home care agency in regards to, um, you know, 
following the proper procedures and protocols to ensure that, that everyone's safe along that, um, that aspect. So during all of this, yeah, we have for sure increased our patient load. Um, and with some of the Medicare changes that I know we'll probably talk about a little bit later, that's actually made it easier for people to um, kind of have that home care benefit and allow us to go out and see them. And so what changes have you made? How are you protecting yourself and, and the patients when you go into the home? And even the, um, I, I mean, you, when you talked about it earlier, you, you really don't have any control over the environment. Yeah. And so other family members may be there and mm. in the care. So, um, you know, we, we started watching this um, in right around February and really, really seeing how things were trending. And, you know, my mentality is, you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best and, and really kind of think of what those worst case scenarios were. And obviously this is something where we, as lymphedema therapists, and I feel what, what we do is essential and we want to continue to continue the service. And so how are we going to do that? And so I've got a great admin team and we developed just awesome protocols in terms of screening patients over the phone, screening our therapists, having the proper protective measures in place to be able to minimize, um, um, exposure, as well as, you know, check in on patients, you know, I mean, if you think back, you know, February, early March, it seems like forever ago, even it does, it yeah. <laughs> and think about the information that was coming out and, and so much was unsure at that time. And so we felt our obligation to inform patients, you know, we're not the news, we're, we're providing you the, the proper information here in terms of what we can do, how you can be cautious, you need to stay home, we're going to do temperature checks, we're going to, you know, talk to you over the phone and make sure your family is aware of things. And, um, you know, thankfully here in San Antonio, where I'm at, they've done a phenomenal job at really kind of keeping things at bay. And so we've been able to thrive in that environment. And, you know, I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't stressful and difficult, but, you know, with that, you really have to make the most of these opportunities so you can continue to serve and do what you do. Right. So tell me what's, what some of those Medicare changes are. I'm sure that people listening in the audience would like to know also. And yes. they are changing um, probably weekly. And, yes. and we'll share some resources for or where they can find that information. Yeah, so I actually have, have a form here. Um, so I don't know if you can see this, but uh, it's the Home Health Flexibilities from CMS. It's dated um, uh, the 15th of this month. And so this is the most up-to-date, but tomorrow a new one can come out be completely <laughs> yeah. different. So we're going to go with this today. So some of the major things that uh, from a home care environment that have changed for the better is the first thing is the face-to-face -face document. It's something that is required where a uh, physician uh, or now a nurse practitioner or a PA sees the person and then allows them um, to have home care. Basically, you're certifying that they're okay for home care. Well, previously that had to be done face-to-face, -face. it's in the document. But now they're allowing for telemedicine to occur and use that as a face-to-face. -face. So if you do you know, um, some sort of Zoom call or FaceTime or whatever with the patient and the physician or PA or NP establishes a relationship with them, you can use that as the face-to-face -face visit, which is great because then that removes burden of care of having to get someone into the physician's office and see. So that's, that, that's a great part of it. Um, you're limiting that care. And the other thing that I just touched on is allowing a non-MD provider to be able to certify for home care and sign orders. So that's huge. So, you know, we see most clinics now, it's, it's you know, NPs and PAs, great practitioners, amazing right. job. And there are extensions of that MD. And so now, instead of having to wait for the MD and, and get that signature, now we can utilize an NP or a PA to be able to sign off on the documents necessary for home care, which is you know, awesome and uh, makes things so much easier uh, for everyone. So now going into um, some of the um, states that are reopening, uh -huh. is that going to, I mean, these patients are still considered homebound because... Yeah, so in terms of the homebound status, um, the, the Medicare definition of taking a considerable and taxing effort to leave the home, that's kind of been the, the gold standard uh, for the longest time. So a provider, an MD, a PA, an MP, can certify a patient as being homebound if they are at risk of COVID. So you can have a person that functionally, you know, can do things that maybe would not not qualify them for, for um, being homebound. Now, because they need to stay home, they cannot, they should not be exposed to others. They can be certified as being homebound due to that risk of COVID. So going back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of our caseload increasing, that was one of the right. things that really was um, an opportunity for us because 
we are able to go out and treat so many uh, more patients because of that. And then also be an extension of the physician where they, we can go out and do a hands-on assessment and be able to provide that information to the physician if maybe it was a telemedicine face-to-face and they actually hadn't physically been with the patient. So it was kind of a win for everyone um, having these regulatory changes. It will be really interesting to see where this goes because yes. you're, you are, there's going to be a huge population of patients that are going to want to receive care at home uh-huh. just out of fear of you know, being exposed to the virus for, yep. for the unforeseen future, right? So yeah. I'm going to share the, um, oh, how come I can't ex- And I'm going to add to it as well with the whole telemedicine thing. All my patients yeah. absolutely love it. I mean, the burden is on them, especially with my more advanced wound care patients to be able to go out and rent, you know, pay someone to take them for the physician's office and they're there all day they love having the telemedicine. It's, it's, an, it's an awesome aspect of um, that's changed. And hopefully it's something that'll stay around for a while. So the, um, the resources that we're gonna provide, it's really um, CMS, um, Palmetto GBA, CDC, who, and I would also say, if you have, um, like for us, we have the Texas Association of Home Care. If you have some sort of association you belong to that's more specific to what you deal with, whether you are in the, um, the uh, home care environment, whether you're in, you know, medicine of uh, like wound care, vascular, you know, follow them. And then me as a physical therapist, the APTA, home health section, those are some great resources I've utilized. And then also you can look at your, and you should be following obviously your, your city, your state, because here in Texas, it's a little bit different than what's happening all over the place. So it does so much in regards to determining where that outcome, where that, that final journey is going to be. And so some, it's definitely something that has changed over the years and, and developed um, as I've seen what's been important, what hasn't been. I know you we were talking earlier when I, when I first started doing my evaluations, if anyone out there has gotten their CLT, and mine was quite a long time ago, but Job's had a really big measuring board that you would use to yeah, measure yeah. out the <laughs> right. And so yes. my very first patient, I took this huge monstrosity, and they're like, I'm going to take every single measurement that I need to all the way up to your hip. <laughs> And, you know, it took me two hours to do my evaluation. And by the end of that week, that thing was destroyed in the back of my car. And I'm like, okay, we need to, we need to think of something different that's a little more appropriate to the home care setting. So for me, I really want to understand that person's story. Uh, just because of maybe the population that I see, a lot of these individuals don't really understand what lymphedema is, what they have, and how long they've had it for, and really what, how the disease has progressed. And so I really want to know, how long ago did things start? And not when things got bad, not when you got cellulitis, not when you got wounds, but really when you started to notice when did your edema just really first start? Because edema going bad a year ago versus three decades ago is when it really, really started. That's when we start to determine, is this primary? Is this secondary? How was this disease developed? And then we start to tease out okay, oh, you had your hysterectomy at this time, you had your total knee replacement at this time, this is when you got put on insulin. These are all factors that's affecting that lymphatic system as we start to kind of build, okay, why is this happening? So that's really my first thing is I'm starting to- uh, I love that you kind of already are talking about not, not, not yesterday, not last week, not when you had your knee replacement, but Tell me about 10 years ago, right? Or tell me about when you first started to notice that intermittent swelling. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that's, it's so important. And then from there, as I mentioned, I want to kind of develop their story. What's, what's unique about this situation to them? I'll have some people that, you know, they had uh, lymphedema therapy five, 10 years ago and just have kind of fallen off of things uh, for the time being. And so now we're just kind of reiterating things and getting them back on track or have other, others that are just, it's completely, they have no idea what's going on. And, you know, the, the hour that I spend with them, I've given them more information than the past 10, 20 years of them dealing with it. So it's a combination of understanding where they're at. So you can really kind of tailor made that uh, plan of care for them, but also help them with that buy-in. Uh, lymphedema is a very involved treatment. It, it's something that they have to be committed to as well. And so 
I really want to understand where they're at because I don't want to overwhelm them. I want them to buy into what we're going to be going on together. And so I really want to understand you know, where they're at with things because I go in there for that first 45 minutes an hour. I could dump so much. I mean, look how much we're going to be talking tonight about all this. I, I can talk, I can tell them so many things, but I really just want to start at one point. Okay. What's, what's the one thing that we're going to start to get success on? What's that first lead domino, domino that we're going to focus on? And maybe it's positioning, maybe it's compression, maybe it's, you know, teach them to diaphragmatic breathe. You know, it's really trying to understand what that is for them uh, so we can build out that plan of care. Okay, so when you're talking, let's just talk a little bit about your documentation, okay? Because I know that is extremely important now, um, especially with Medicare patients. And yes. they're really looking for specific information and the way that you talk about how you're painting a picture of this patient and really showing um, what some of not only not only their functional deficits and you know how is impacting them functionally, but also a looking at um, physically the, the state of their lymphedematous leg, you know, yeah. and really talking about that. So I'm going to just show, pull up some of these pictures to show some of the um, scenarios that you probably see every day. And, let, and I want you to just talk about these, these key terms. Yeah. So um, these are these are all my photos that we're going to go through, and these are very typical things that we see in the lymphedema world. And what's interesting is, you know, we we're now putting key terms onto what these conditions are. But these are things that, as I talk to therapists and they come in and you know, I'm teaching them about lymphedema for the first time, they've seen this forever, but you didn't right. have words for. You didn't really understand, like, okay, what is this that's going on? Mm -hmm. And so. So yeah, my hope here today is uh, to really kind of put some words and some definitions to kind of help you better understand uh, what's going on with all these conditions. And um, I did mention earlier during my eval, but I use a lot of pictures, a lot of pictures. And the reason I do that for a couple things is, you know, I'm writing in my eval, right? Hyperkeratosis, hyperplasia, all this sort of thing. Right. Then I have this picture attached to it. You get a completely different idea of mm -hmm. what is going on. And then also when it comes to the buy-in, if you actually have really good photos from the, from the first visit and maybe your 30-day and 60-day, you can kind of compare those side by side and you can show that to them. They really start, wow, that was me? This is me now? Whose legs are these? Those are some right. really important things, just some kind of side notes that you know, I utilize really heavily. So, all right. Hyperkeratosis, it is basically epidermal hyperplasia and it's a very specific type. It's the building up of uh, one of the skin layers, layers the stratum corneum, and you combine that with um, basically static lymphatic fluid, where you get this start to get this huge overgrowth of, uh, of keratin cells, and it can be velvety, it can be warty. This picture, for instance, is a foot. Um, the larger mm -hmm. nodule is over the, the great toe, the great toes right. under, and it's something that can really build out. Now it doesn't have to look like this to this extreme. You can just get little hyperkeratosis on the toes and between the toes, maybe behind the knee in the middle of the thigh. You can also have it, and there's a couple other terms, um, lichenization or mossy foot, where it's the same um, skin cells being uh, overdeveloped, but not building up on top of each other, but more as thin layers over it. So those are a couple different manners. Okay, well. Um, you can just let us know when you want us to advance. Yeah, we'll go over to the next one now. Okay. The next one is uh, hyperplasia. So first I wanted to differentiate. You have an epidermal versus a vascular. Hyperplasia just means overgrowth. So you can have this of the vascular system where you have a hyperplasia of lymphatics where there's too much lymphatics going on which decreases pressure and there's a mess up flow in terms of going from distal to proximal in the lymphatic system. But more specifically, we're talking about uh, epidermal hyperplasia, where the skin starts to become almost scale-like. Um, essentially, when you are taking off of the, maybe the, um, the cotton layer you have if you're doing bandaging or even some of the garments, a lot of the skin comes with it. It creates a nice cloud of skin as you're taking <laughs> off. You, try to, you know, step back a little bit if it's really dry. So that, that's what that is, it's hyperplasia. You can also have it where maybe you're doing some MLD or you're putting on some lotion, it gets all over your gloves, the, you know, it starts to bleed a little bit, maybe some wounds come out, that's what that is. Okay. If we're talking about specific to, to lymphedema, uh, it's really dermal hyperplasia secondary to lymphedema, if you really wanted to get technical with what that is in terms of that specific word. 
Okay, we can go to the next one. All right, hyperpigmentation. Uh, it's in the word, excessive pigment. So I put underneath there, hemosiderin staining. This is key. Um, in San Antonio, it's a, it's a very large diabetic population here. So if you were to go downtown, go to Fiesta, you would see this everywhere, absolutely everywhere. It's just a very common thing. And what this is, is essentially you have your venous system, too high pressure, refluxing backwards, and the pressure is so high, instead of going up, it starts to go out into the skin. It's, mm -hmm. I tell my patients it's like a reverse tattoo, where you have red blood cells depositing iron into the skin, and that's, that's what you get. Very, very common in those right. phlebo-lymphedema diagnoses, where you've got venous disease leading into lymphedema, extremely, extremely common. Do you often have patients asking you if it's going to resolve? Yeah, um, they ask me if it'll go away, and I say it'll lessen a little bit. But I also use that as a teaching opportunity for them because I let them know, look, this did not happen overnight, okay? And the process of the body healing itself is a very, very long, long road. And so I always tell them, the key thing you want to look for is robust, robustness of your skin. How robust and resilient can we make your skin? That's the most important thing. You know, some of the things I'm not going to be able to change in terms of maybe the pigmentation of that, sure. but I want to make sure their skin is as strong as possible is what I'm looking for. And I, I think it goes back to your pictures. I love that you take all of these photos because patients have a really short memory of what they're mm -hmm. like, and they want it to be continuing to get better and better. But when you can start showing them some of that progress, I yes. guess it's a huge difference. Most definitely. Or, or I'll show them like, hey, these are some of my success stories because they mm -hmm. want to know, oh, well, I can look like that. This is possible. Right. That, that definitely helps. Yeah. All right. Let's look at the next one. Okay. Of all the words that we're going to go over, the terms we're going to go over today, this is probably the most well-known one, elephantiasis. Essentially, this is stage three lymphedema. With that, it's non-reversible. You're getting fixed skin folds, as, as you can see in the photo here. Um, it can be bilateral, but it can be unilateral. It's, it's typically going to be seen with a lot of these other terms that we have going on in the picture here. There's hyperkeratosis as well that's happening. It's the obvious lymphedema is what that is. It's extremely, extremely firm. It's something that you really, really can't miss. And it is something that for all the practitioners out there, you want to touch it. You want to put your hands on it because cardiac edema and elephantiasis feel very, very different in terms of when you, when you feel them. And so it's important because you can look, oh, you have swelling, elevate, here's, your, you know, here's whatever medication, but let's really figure out what's going on here in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the limb. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, let's look at the next one. Okay, so papillomatosis. So this is kind of looking back at the, um, the hi uh, hyperkeratosis, but it's forming uh, very specific papillae or finger-like projections. Uh, the picture here is the medial thigh. You see these a lot on the medial thigh. You mm -hmm. have this, a large lobe that starts to develop. And then I th just think because of the shape and um, as gravity starts to take over, they start to project out. These are things that are very, very sensitive. I've had patients where just in the act of transferring, uh, they've torn them or the skin eventually starts to erupt. And so you start to uh, develop wounds inside of there. Um, and they're very vascularized. So you have to be really careful about cellulitis and all sorts of other things going on in there. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so just kind of interested in the nurses you work with, the doctors you work with, do you do some education with them in terms of some of these key words? Because I, 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 document, yeah. documenting on the same same issues, right? Yes, most most definitely. And um, there's some there's some really good uh, documents out there in terms of uh, some you know kind of delving into some of these terms and really defining them. There's some good uh, physicians out there that have done that, and it's really just kind of coming together as a team in terms of how you're describing this stuff, right? Um, you know, I, I've got a, I've got a Wunker physician in San Antonio and I read her notes and I'm just like, I love, I text her. I love your notes. Like you have all these great words in here and it's just phenomenal. And, <laughs> and it, it just makes such a big difference because you're, you're really describing a disease process that manifests in so many ways, has so many um, different types of qualitative nature to it that you, know, you want it, you want to describe this because, you know, when I see something like that come through, like this is the patient I'm getting. 
that tells me so much more than lymphedema eval and treat. And when I get that, I'm like, right. I have no idea what to expect. But right. you know, these terms to be able to discuss them, it really goes a long way. Yeah. Hmm. I think we got two more or one more. All right, uh, lymphorrhea. So essentially what this is, is lymphatic fluid coming through the skin. There's kind of two different manifestations that we have going on there. So you have one on the, on the outside picture. I don't know if it's your left or right. Um, you can see some yellowing on there. That's lymphatic fluid. What that is, is essentially the lymphatic fluid was coming through the skin and then dried. Now, in some of my patients who have really, really, really bad lymphedema and very poor skin integrity, I can take off their compression and in a relatively short period of time, lymphatic fluid will start weeping through their skin. It's like dew forming on the skin. That's not very common, but a lot of times what you'll see is over the course of them wearing their bandages for you know, one, two, three days, lymphatic fluid will come out, especially if it's early on in treatment. And so it's important as you're removing your bandages or whatever layers you have on, wound, wound dressings, APD pads, whatever, you're looking at that like, okay, what's come off of the skin and what's on here? It, it's a way that you can kind of assess what's going on. Oh wow, there's lymphatic fluid on here. They, they have lymphorrhea. It may not be active, but they're capable of doing it and they did have it at one point. So that, that's one aspect of it. The other one is, I think that's uh, like a popliteal space. So that's behind the knee. So oh. that's, that's where that's at. So essentially what you can have is, the, and this are, these are my hardest lymphedema patients. It's not, it's not the big elephantiasis. It, it's, it's really, it's almost always little old ladies. It's the little old ladies <laughs> with very, 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 very thin skin where you can get one bit of your pressure gradient wrong. It throws everything off. Mm -hmm. and this was an instance where the pressure made a move a little bit on the bandages and it caused lymphatic fluid to either blister up or you can even see it to the left a little bit starting to fill up underneath the skin. And uh, those are things where wounds form and you have to work with your physician in terms of, okay, you know, how are we going to lance this and cover it and that sort of thing. But yeah, those are, you know, definitely something you have to take into account, um, you know, in terms of your documentation and all that. Well, and I think it's important to, to know when you are document, documenting that you don't need to see this like weeping leg sure. to document that this patient has lymphorrhea. And with insurance companies really needing these terms, you, ha you should be able to recognize that. Mm -hmm. uh, by just looking at some of the bandages and what's on their leg. Oh, most definitely. And, and I'll even ask them during my eval, you know, have you ever had fluid come out of your legs? You know, and you'd be amazed some of the stories you get. I've had sure. people, oh yeah, you know, it's a regular thing for me to duct tape trash bags to my legs so I don't get fluid all over my Oh my gosh. You know, and, and so <laughs> it, it's just kind of part, but you want to know what that journey is, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I don't know if there might be one more. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, that was it. Okay. So um, just moving on towards, uh, you know, speaking about the doctors and the nurses that you work with within your agency, uh, what does that team look like? What is your, you know, I, I think you had mentioned at one point, you know, the way that you have approached mm -hmm. um, COVID, for example, getting ready and really having that team in place. Can you talk a little bit about that um, that uh, multidisciplinary team you have? So I mentioned when I first started doing this, um, I, I did, I, I was the only one that I knew of that was doing this. And so I made it a point to really start to reach out to individuals and whether they were uh, DME reps, whether they were um, other physicians that I think may have saw lymphedema, other lymphedema therapists all over the country. I really tried to understand, okay, how, what's the life cycle of a lymphedema patient? You know, a lot of the times they're seen at a primary and they say, oh, you have leg swelling. A lot of times, though, it's you have wounds or something like that, or you got cellulitis. Let me send you to this wound center or let me send you to this vascular center. And then from there, um, you know, maybe it's a therapy or maybe, you know, they end up in the hospital and then it's hospital, then it's a, a LTAC and then it's a nursing home. And so I was really trying to understand what the lifestyle is. And so I was trying to find practitioners that I could say, hey, you see lymphedema, I treat lymphedema, let's work together on this. So I made it a point to build that, that team out and really develop those relationships. This is not something where you, know, you can refer to me and now our relationship is done. It's like, no, I, I wanna have a relationship with the wound physician or the vascular physician or the traveling MD because we need to have that, that feedback and that conversation in regards to care and how we're gonna change care. And you know, if any of them are watching, I absolutely love all the clinicians I work with at San Antonio. They, they're, yeah. Phenomenal. And, and 
being able to to give them a phone call no matter time or day about patients or say hey you know i have someone that looks like this what do you think it's helped so much. So that's my external team. And then I have an internal team where I have a great group of therapists. I have an awesome coordinator. Um, I have awesome reps with the different um, vendors that we work with that from the get go, I'm deciding, okay, for my eval from, from that day one, what is this going to look like? Okay. What are we going to start working on? What is their insurance like? And how are we going to look at eventual garment funding? Is this a person that's appropriate for a pneumatic compression device? If so, we're going to start sending out the referral right away and start working on the, um, the steps necessary for whatever it is for approval. And then working that system out. Uh, most of the patients that I see are medically complex. So working with my nursing staff, if it's something where, yes, they have lymphedema, but they have congestive heart failure, they have type 2 diabetes, they're going to dialysis. These are things that now I'm working with my team um, to, to build that approach out. So let's talk about that a little bit because um, I know that not every therapist uh, works along um, the same or thinks along the same lines as you do, you know, sort of always beginning with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm out in the field quite a bit talking to therapists and nurses. And uh, um, when, when I talk about um, pneumatic compression, for example, and, and even night garments or stockings, whatever it is that you need to have, when is it that you are making that referral for those um, tools that are going to set this patient up for success. And some of the answers I get are, well, I send them home, and this is always in an outpatient setting, typically yeah. not in home care, of course, but when I, when I send the patient home, I send them with a home program, and when they come back and it wasn't successful, I now introduce the device. Or mm -hmm. they will say, I teach them how to do self-manual and drainage, and when they come back and they say they couldn't do it very well, well, of course they couldn't because it's not very practical. Yeah. So can you speak to that a little bit and tell me, what do you say to those therapists? Yeah. So granted, what I get to do in the home care is going to be different than what happens in an outpatient clinic. I totally yeah. understand if there are time constraints and authorization constraints, you really kind of have to kind of throw in like what you think is going to stick. For me personally, I'm, I'm always thinking, okay, at what point can I leave this person by themselves and they are not going to regress? As lymphedema therapists, we've all experienced where we spent one month getting that person beautiful and then one week they go out of town or something yeah. and right back to square one, right? right? I don't want that to happen. So I have to think, okay, what are the, what's the necessary situation where I could throw every possible available thing at this person that's going to help them be successful? And if they have that available to them, I want to do that. So we look at CDT, right? Two phases. You got acute phase, you got chronic phase. You've got compression, male lymphatic drainage, all this exercise, skin care, all this stuff in the first phase. Now we're doing the same stuff. We're just progressing them to garments that they're doing and then some sort of MLD that they're doing on themselves or they're using a device to do that. So these are, these are parameters that fit for virtually everyone. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So let's say I get a person in garments, right? And they just they just mess up one day. Well, I want them to have the ability to reset. Once again, most of my patients are very long down the road. They don't have a lot of room for error. So if I feel like a pneumatic compression device might help them reset, is that control, delete, okay? Like I did a bad day, I'm gonna go put this on, it's gonna help me out. Then mm -hmm. I'm gonna do, then, then I want them to have that, okay? And so it may not be something they have to use every day, but if it's something that they have available to them that's a tool to equip them to help be successful, then obviously I wanna do that. So that's your thought process when you're doing the eval. I mean, you're thinking about, um, I'm always looking to know that this patient will have what they need right away. Mm -hmm. Most right. definitely. And obviously with insurances, you know, sometimes these things take a long time. And so at the end that's, of the day, yeah. if we decide no, well, okay, well, then at least we went through the process and I don't have to wait another four, eight weeks. Because I don't know if I'm going through an insurance that requires authorization, if they're even going to give that to me. So let, let's, let's do this. And we all know lymphedema is a progressive condition, right? I mean, as a person ages and maybe other comorbidities come into play, this is something that it's a constant battle. You know, you really want to, you know, stop that regression as much as you possibly can. You know, sometimes in home care, it's not, oh, I'm going to reach for this ultimate goal way up in the sky. It's, I want to keep you maybe, you know, 10% better and keep you there. So you're not declining significantly. 
you know, that maybe really is the case in home care, isn't yeah. it? Uh, I mean, the expectations are much different. Most and definitely. you probably have had to adjust a, a little bit with um, a different population that is now at home as well. Yes. Yeah, most definitely. And, yeah. and um, you know, it's, it's, there's a wide gamut in terms of motivations, in terms of, um, you know, desires to get better. And some people, they start off slow and then they start to pick up. You know, some of the things that I do to kind of gauge that, and all my team knows this about me, is it always starts with their bandages, right? We uh, provide a certain amount of bandages to them. It's, it's my, my starter kit for them, which is kind of my basic compression that we do that everyone kind of starts with. And that's my, my tool to use. If that person can manage their own bandages, wash them, roll them, have them ready for me, have them set aside, I can automatically tell that person it's has what it to takes you. to take care of themselves <laughs> versus here's my ball of dirty spaghetti, here, roll it, and now let's put it back on my legs, right? Yeah, I've had a few of those come into the, um, <laughs> come into the clinic with their garbage bag full of wet bandages. <laughs> exactly right, exactly right. And so, but, but that's the train tool. You know, day one, this is a condition that is yours. You have to own it. I'm going to provide everything I possibly can for you to be successful. But at the end of the day, you have to wear your compression. You have to use your pump. You have to modify your environment and be smart with what you do. And the, yeah. the more you do that, the better you get at it. But, you know, healing from lymphedema, especially in the more chronic, you know, more uh, progressive situations, it takes months and years. This is not a days and weeks situation. Right. And I think about, um, I've only worked in the outpatient setting, but, you know, I always thought, well, I'm setting up my patient to be successful at home. And you really have the same goals. I mean, yes. your goals are the same. You're, you're there, but you aren't going to be there forever. You cannot be there to help them forever. So exactly right. an average um, time that you see patients or do you have, is it just all over the board? It is all over the place. You know, sometimes it's, it's a month, you know, sometimes it's a year. It, okay. it matters. And, you know, we didn't get into it, but I mean, there, there, there are some parameters for maintenance therapy within um, Medicare and coverage uh, for progressive incurable conditions, which lymphedema falls under. So there are situations where it's like, if I were to leave, this person would regress in a day and go back to the hospital because they have no one that can't care for themselves. So those are extreme situations. But likewise, you know, a month and they're good to go. And, you know, it, it's just kind of all over the place. Right. Okay, um, so I think we are at about 7.45 in Central Time. So I think we can open it up to questions. So one question um, I have here is, how do you charge for supplies? Okay, so that's gonna be very specific to what your setting is. So under home care, um, if let's say it's a Medicare patient, we have to provide supplies for them. So we have to be very judicious in what we use. And so, uh, so with that, um, you know, we don't charge patients uh, for anything at all. Um, so we just have to be smart with that. There's a certain percentage if you're uh, billing Medicare, uh, let's say they have, um, they have wounds, there's a certain uh, percentage set aside for wound care and that sort of thing. And um, unfortunately, if they don't have a wound, even though you're providing compression, it doesn't recognize that there's no algorithm for, oh, you're putting on compression, let's reimburse you more for these supplies. Unfortunately, that's just not how it is. So you know, one thing for us is, going back to my eval, um, I'm always asking about what type of insurance they have. In San Antonio, there's a huge military population. So there's a lot of retired federal employees and retired military. So they have TRICARE for Life, they have Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal as a secondary insurance. And a lot of those insurances, if you work with the right DME company, will get things covered. So you may be going for uh, maybe some sort of the, the cut and, um, and fit um, sort of kits versus bandages because that's actually covered you kind of have to be creative with that. Um, okay. I wish there was better funding out there, but you have to make do with what you have. All right. So another question is how do you treat um, your patients with lymphorrhea? Um, so a lot of the times with that, they'll have had uh, stasis ulcers as well um, along with that. And so I treat it pretty much the same way. You, you think about the pathophysiology of what's going on with that. 
granted it matters where it's at and to what degree it is and how exactly. much it's coming out. But you know, to make wound care very simple, if it's really, really wet, do stuff to absorb it. If it's really, really dry, do stuff to make it a little bit wetter. You're trying to find that Goldilocks zone, that homeostasis of what's going on. And so there's times like, let's say for instance, I have someone that has lymphorrhea through the toes. That I've seen that, it is crazy difficult to treat. And so I may have to, let's say it's on a Monday, I may have to front load my week where I'm going out there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just to get kind of a, just a, a little hold in terms of, we're doing compression, right? Compression leads to maceration because you're creating a closed environment, you know? So you have a wet environment being created by the compression you need to stop the wetness from coming out. Yeah. Some sort of paradox <laughs> going on. And so, so I may do that up front where I'm, you know, cutting different types of foam or I'm doing different types of absorptive dressings and I'm putting a, you know, Coban around the toes or something like that to be able to apply compression to stop stuff from coming out. But I have to change it more frequently uh, to be able to make sure the tissue is not being macerated. So you really have to evaluate how, how weeping it is, that sort of thing. If you know someone that's a wound care vendor or you know people that are really good with wound dressings, find the appropriate wound dressing that will absorb that fluid. And then it's just putting compression on it. Because think about why is it happening? There's not enough fluid going up, so it's going out. So you want to promote that fluid going up along its natural channel. You know, stasis ulcers is pretty easy because you just the skin heals itself once you remove the the, um, the fluid. Right, and I can I can speak to the flexi touch with yeah. the lymphorrhea because I don't know if you've had luck with patients, but we've seen um, patients do really well with the um, flexi touch with lymphorrhea, and you know within a within a week or two the the legs are dry. Most definitely. You know, I'm going to add something to that. So here, here's, a, here's, a little, here's a little tip and trick. So let's say you have someone that is weeping out of the legs really, really bad, right? And you're wrapping from the foot to the knee, that sort of thing. Let's say they have a flexi touch. They're afraid of maybe, you know, I don't want to get anything on my flexi touch. If they have a trunk unit, I've done it where I just use the trunk unit where, mm -hmm. I'm, where I'm decongesting proximally because the, the more you can remove that barrier of that fluid moving towards the cardiovascular system, the, the easier it is for the legs to decongest. So I've combined both of those together and it's worked phenomenally well where I'm like, okay, well, we're decongesting the uppers because I don't want to wrap because it's restricting your mobility, but you can use this throughout the day while my bandages and my wound care dressings are working down below. That's, that's such a great idea. Have you used that with wound care, right? I mean, it, when they can tolerate the um, pressure of anything over the area that they have a wound, so you... Yeah. Yeah, so, so it, you know, I, I gauge that. I'd, I'd prefer if I could do it over the uh, bandaging and dressing if I could, but sure. if I can't, I'm going to utilize everything I can. Like I said, if I can move fluid and I can use this, I can use the flexi touch to move proximal fluid from their abdomen and their thighs so it clears that area so all my bandage pressure is moving that fluid up, then, you know, we're winning that way. Yeah, definitely. So let's see, we have, um, do you have to wait until they are discharged to order garments? So there's, Medicare is funny, right? Medicare is a funny thing. So there is a way for Medicare to cover a basic garment, right? But they cannot have home care, which is the craziest thing to me. So let me get this right. I'm going to discharge my patient, order them a garment, send the garment to them, and then there's no one to train them on it whatsoever. Makes no sense whatsoever. So going back to um, when I'm asking them about insurance, if they have uh, a good secondary TRICARE Blue Cross Blue Shield and they reach their terminal point and the skin's looking good, I'm ordering the garment, it's coming in. Now we're tr in transition phase because I don't know about you guys, but let's say you order a hose for someone. How many have you seen where, oh, it doesn't fit right. I'm going to fold it over at the top. I'm going right, to double right. the pressure. Now I've created a tourniquet. Now I've got <laughs> blisters for me, right? Now we're moving backwards. So, you know, I see that a lot where people get garments way too early. The skin is not strong enough to handle it. And then it's just not the right fitting garment. Or maybe they just think, oh, yeah, you know, I'll just fold it over three times and it'll work great. So my thing is to provide everything necessary for them to be successful. First, acute phase, heal the skin. Second phase, make them competent with the right tools to manage themselves. So even right. then, we get them the garment and maybe I was seeing them three times a week or maybe at that point, two times a week. I'll still go down to one time a week if I can. Mm -hmm. So that way I'm checking in on them. So that way they're not going backward or doing something crazy. So. Right. Right. Yeah, that's great. Um, so there is a question on here. Um, 
Let me see. At your evaluation, um, this is the time you make your referral for a pump. Which doctor do you contact about ordering? And with our medically complex patients in home care, they often have a specialized team. Uh -huh. So a lot of times it's the referring physician. As I mentioned before, most of my uh, physicians are wound physicians or uh, vascular doctors. And so they're very competent in using this device and treating lymphedema here, here in San Antonio, they're phenomenal. And so I, I typically work with them. If it's a situation where maybe it's a, a patient self-referral or something like that, I'll do a little bit of extra screening on them in terms of vascular um, status or sure. as I'm asking them questions. So here's a, here's a good eval tip for you. So you go out there and you have like the sneaky suspicion, even though it's not on their history and physical that they have CHF. I will typically wrap one leg and very light compression and see how they respond. See if they're mm -hmm. having any cardiac signs from that. And so if they don't have a cardiologist, I'll recommend with their PCP, hey, it might be good to be screened by a cardiologist because you know we're thinking about everything that's going on here. I see edema, I wanna move it out. Okay, but can the system handle it? So we're thinking about those things. So, sure. Yeah, so that, that's part of that whole team approach and you know, using your role, I mean, if you, if you're a doctor of physical therapy, you need to be thinking about these things. You need to be able to screen for referral and be able to you know, be that person that's coordinating that information. Because heck, if, if I get to spend an hour with a person three times a week, three hours a week, that's a whole lot of time of a medical practitioner spending with a person that I should be able to get a lot of information and coordinate appropriately. You know, I know that our reps work really closely with their therapists and, um, can you tell me what that relationship looks like for you in terms of, do you just give the rep information or do you reach out to the doctor or do you, um, depending on which doctor I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. So if it's kind of like, let's say it's my standard phlebo lymphedema patient, I've seen tons of times it's a, it's an established referral source that I know like maybe my rep works with as well, or one of the other ones in the city. In my eval, I, I do a good kind of email to all the team. And my person that handles all my coordination of DME, she just sends it all over. We know what we need to do. Doctors probably already referred to it anyway. So that just kind of just kind of goes from there. If it's something that's maybe a little more medically complex, um, I'll start to work with the rep and maybe get an idea with them, talk with them, say, hey, what do, what do you think about this? Um, you know, just like me, I mean, I see some of the crazy stuff in the home. And so I'm, I, you know, I kind of have like a, a catalog of things to pull from, but maybe if you're in an outpatient clinic or you don't see lymphedema all the time, you really don't know, you know, go with people that have seen it. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned before, you want to build those relationships and that's what it's yeah. all about. You know, what we're all trying to do here is serve an underserved population that's medically complex. And that's what we're trying to do together. Yeah. That's, I love that you have this, um, system set up with coordinator is it that she just kind of gets everything in place for you yep. not sure every uh, home care agency has the luxury of that <laughs> and it's 85 percent of your senses i mean you kind of have to focus on it that way right right so um well, another question was how do you uh rule out blood clots in the home care setting so normally, as I mentioned before, when they're coming from me, they're coming from wound care, podiatry, or vascular. So it's All of that stuff is already coming in. And, you know, in PT school, you've got your, your home insign, you've got your wealth score. Yeah, you know, we're looking at those things. Um, you know, your unilateral swelling, have you had recent surgery? Is there pain going on there? Some of those things. Um, so it's been very, very rare that I've ever had a blood clot. And every single time, it was well known before they ever came to me. It, it was okay. never a situation. You know, the, probably the, um, probably the situation would be the most acute in terms of me maybe finding that would be after a surgery. Like if someone who had lymphedema, had a knee replacement, now I'm treating the knee replacement, lymph knee replacement edema and the lymphedema, they're a very high risk population. So that's something that I'm looking for. I have a question about the wound care portion of it. I know that nurses typically will go out and do wound care for home care patients. And do you as a PT have the available supplies to actually treat the wound as well as treat the lymphedema? That's, yeah. So when I first started, I, <laughs> it was fun. I would have to coordinate my visit with the nurse. Where the nurse would show up 20 minutes before me, I would show up you know, right after her, so she would done the wound care, legs ready for me, now I can do my treatment on Oh, that. nice. That's not feasible in home care <laughs> <laughs> at all. 
<laughs> and so I learned really early on, the simplest thing is just learn, learn wound care. And mm -hmm. I've, got, I've had some great um, teachers, John Beckwith, Christina Hankins, if you guys are watching, you guys are great. Taught me yeah. everything. Um, at University Hospital, where I did all my clinical rotations, where I got my CLT, it's run by a PTA. Their wound care center is a PTA, PT, OT. They're phenomenal. And so it's within my Texas scope of practice. Granted, wherever you are at, you have to go within your practice act. But if it's within your practice act, learn it. I mean, it's just going to make you a better practitioner. I mean, sure. I, I've, got, I've got to the point where I've done wound vacs and then lymphedema compression over the wound vac. It's phenomenal. And I mean, don't you have a set time though for your home care appointments to mm -hmm. actually get the wound care done and then do the bandaging and yep. so you're working fast. <laughs> years, years one through two, it would have taken me 90 minutes to two hours, <laughs> but 45 minutes, you just, you just get it and go. Get and uh, you know, it's, it's just a skill thing over time. And you know, if you train your patients right, everything's prepped for you and you're, you're ready to go. So yeah, yeah that's great. That's awesome. All right, let me see if we have any room. Uh, maybe one more. Okay. Um, so you mentioned knee replacement uh, edema. Do you, how do you treat that? Oh, that, that's, <laughs> that's going to be a session in all of itself. So, <laughs> not, not in the one minute we have. Not in the one minute, no. <laughs> so uh, that was something I talked about the NLN. It is something I am super interested in. And really, a lot of it is the same way. Um, if, if you think about what's going on in terms of the uh, edema that's forming after a surgery, and you think about also kind of the new changes that have occurred in terms of our understanding of the uh, capillary layer and the lymphatic system, you're creating a huge amount of basically lymphatic fluid in the interstitial space that can only be removed by the lymphatic system. And right. so you have all this swelling around a limb, a studio, specifically a knee, and if you're doing your MLD, you're doing the right compression, you're doing the right exercise, Man, that stuff works so well at removing wow. it. That's great. Um, I think we're out of time, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate talking to you. It's been really um, interesting, and I think that the audience is going to um, agree with that. So thank you so much, Josh. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.